Greetings and salutations, my fellow math enthusiasts and students of all things mathematical. My name is Sean Spartan, and this video concludes my series on figurate numbers, which are numbers that relate to certain geometric shapes in two or higher dimensions. In this video, I will introduce the polyhedral numbers which are based on certain three-dimensional shapes, and will also be touching on the fourth and higher dimensional polytopes. If you are unfamiliar with polygonal numbers and would like to learn more about them, I recommend watching the previous videos in this series. But to quickly recap, uh, polygonal numbers are numbers of unit objects, usually called dots, that can be arranged in the shape of a convex regular polygon. For example, 10 is a triangular number, but it is not square, while the number 9 is a square number but not triangular, yet the number 36 is both triangular and square. In fact, 36 is the 8th triangular number and the 6th square number. Since there are infinitely many types of convex regular polygons, um, therefore there are infinitely many types of polygonal numbers. Here are some of the types of polygonal numbers discussed in the previous videos along with the formula used to calculate them. But what would happen if we added a dimension? How many types of figure numbers exist in three dimensions? What about four or more? That's what we're going to explore in this video. In two dimensions, we had polygons, but in three dimensions, the shapes we will be studying are called polyhedra. And specifically, we want to look at all polyhedra that are convex and regular. Convex meaning that if I connect any two points within the shape by a line segment, that line segment also lies within the shape. This is going to exclude uh, star type shapes. And regular meaning uniform length, area, angles, etc. throughout the shape. These special convex regular polyhedra are called the platonic solids, and surprisingly, there are only five of them. These are the platonic solids in three dimensions. As I said, there are only five of them, which may seem counterintuitive. After all, there were infinitely many of these objects in two dimensions, so why so few in three dimensions? You would think that adding dimensions increases room, right? Well, the reason that higher dimensions are more restrictive is that a convex regular solid in k-dimensional space will have sides that are k minus one dimensional. And these k minus one dimensional sides need to fit together around a k-dimensional corner perfectly with no overlapping. For example, a three-dimensional tetrahedron or triangular pyramid shown here has sides that are two-dimensional triangles. A four-dimensional hypercube, or tesseract, has sides that are three-dimensional cubes. The higher the dimension of the object, the higher the dimension of the sides, which create restrictions on how they can fit together without overlapping. Now, my brief explanation really doesn't do the topic justice, so I will put a link to a number file video in the description that explains it much better than I'm doing here. And if you want to know more about it, uh, please watch that video, and I actually learned quite a bit from it. So getting back to the platonic solids, the simplest is the tetrahedron, or triangular pyramid, which is a three-dimensional analog of the triangle. You'll notice it has four sides that are all equilateral triangles. The next simplest platonic solid is the cube, which has six sides that are all squares. There is, of course, the dodecahedron, that is based off the pentagon, and the last two solids, which are the octahedron and the icosahedron, are uh, both based on the triangle. But I will focus on the numbers associated with the tetrahedron and the cube. Cubic numbers are simple. Uh, they're just positive integers raised to the third power. So I get 1, 8, 27, 64, etc. So I like to focus on the tetrahedral numbers. Like all figure numbers, the tetrahedral numbers represent dots or any small unit object that can be arranged in a specific pattern, in this case, a tetrahedron. However, if you notice, to get the nth tetrahedral number, all you need to do is to add together all the triangular numbers from 1 to n. That is because the shape of the tetrahedron has a triangle associated with the nth triangular number as its base, and all consecutive smaller triangular cross-sections on top until you reach the highest point, which is 1, which is just delta sub 1, or the first triangular number. I'm using the symbol delta for triangular because it looks like a triangle, and I am already using t for tetrahedral numbers. Therefore, the nth tetrahedral number, t sub n, is equal to the sum 
from 1 to n of k times k plus 1 over 2, which is equal to n times n plus 1 times n plus 2, all divided by 6. We will prove this using a technique called induction. Before I go ahead with my proof, I need to introduce the concept of induction, which is a very useful tool to have whenever you want to prove an infinite amount of things with a finite amount of steps. If you're already familiar with induction, please skip ahead a bit. Uh, basically, if I have a theorem that I want to show is true for any positive integer n, I can prove it in two parts. For part one, I will need to show that it is true for my base case, which is usually when n equals one. And for part two, I will assume that the statement holds true for n minus one, and I will use that assumption to show that it is also true for n. That completes the proof by principle of mathematical induction, or PMI for short. So the statement that I want to prove is that for any positive integer n, the nth tetrahedral number t sub n is equal to n times n plus 1 times n plus 2, all divided by 6. Uh, the first part is relatively easy. I just plug in 1 for n, and I get 1 times 2 times 3, which is 6, all divided by 6, which is 1, and this is true. t sub 1 is equal to 1, which is the first tetrahedral number, so basically it represents the top of the pyramid. Step two is a bit more complicated, but we can get through it using a little algebra and some facts we already know about tetrahedral numbers. First, we will assume that the formula holds true for n minus one. Now we will examine t sub n. Remember that the nth tetrahedral number is just all of the triangular numbers from one to n summed together. Again, I am using the symbol delta to represent the nth triangular number because uh, the Greek letter delta looks like a triangle. So we have t sub n is equal to delta one plus delta 2, etc., plus delta n minus 1 plus delta n. But notice this is equal to t sub n minus 1 plus delta n. And we assume the formula holds true for n minus 1. So this is equal to n minus 1 times n times n plus 1, all divided by 6 plus delta n. But recall from a previous video on triangular numbers that the nth triangular number delta sub n is equal to n times n plus one divided by two. Now that we have everything in terms of n, we can apply our algebra and simplify, creating a common denominator, combining terms, multiplying through and simplifying yields t sub n equals n times n plus one times n plus two all divided by six, which is what we wanted to show in the first place. This completes the proof and the theorem is proved by principle of mathematical induction, or PMI for short. Now that's all well and good, but what happens in higher dimensions, like in dimension four, five, six, etc., where we can't see the shapes? Recall that in two dimensions, we looked at polygons, and in three dimensions, we looked at polyhedra. The general term for these types of objects is called K polytopes, where the K indicates the dimension that the objects live in. So in the fourth dimension, there are actually six regular polytopes that you can see here. Actually, you are seeing projections of them since I can't show them in 4D on your screen. Below them are diagrams of the three regular five polytopes. And from the fifth dimension onward, there are in fact always only three regular polytopes. Again, for an explanation of this, I highly recommend the number file video about K polytopes that I have in the description. So in the higher dimensions, as I said, there are only three regular polytopes. There are the K simplex series, which are higher dimensional analogs of the tetrahedron. There's the K hypercube series, which are higher dimensional analogs of the cube and its dual, the K orthoplex series. To attain the dual of a regular geometric object with faces, you place a vertex at the center of each face and then connect the vertices. If you look at the cube, placing a vertex at the center of each side and connecting them creates an octahedron. So basically, there is an octahedron hiding inside of every cube. And this is true for all of the higher dimensions as well. However, if you create the dual of a tetrahedron by placing vertices at the center of its triangular faces, connecting the vertices gives you a smaller inverted tetrahedron, which is not a new shape. This is why there are only three regular polytopes in the higher dimensions and not four, because the dual of the K simplex is just another K simplex, but the dual of the K hypercube is the K orthoplex.
Of course, all of these polytopes have figurate numbers associated with them, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss k orthoplex numbers and k hypercube numbers, which are frankly not very interesting. Basically, the formula for the nth k hypercube number is just n to the kth power. So I'd like to talk about the k simplex series and their associated numbers. Recall that a k simplex is a k-dimensional analog of the triangle or tetrahedron, and there's a simple construction for creating a k plus one dimensional simplex from an existing k simplex. You draw a point at the center of your k simplex and connect it to all the existing vertices. Then you increase the length of these line segments to match, and that's gonna pop out your central vertex into the k plus one dimension. Shown above is how it's done for k equals two. In the two dimensional case, we have a triangle. I draw a point in the center and connect the lines. Then I increase the lengths of the line segments so that the object is regular. This forces out my center into the third dimension, and now I have a tetrahedron. Now we've already seen formulas for the k simplex numbers when k is equal to two and three, but there are corresponding formulas for all k. But they basically all follow the same pattern. To calculate the nth k plus one simplex number, you add the first to the nth k simplex numbers together. So you can always create a list of k plus one simplex numbers looking at the list of k simplex numbers and creating a sequence of partial sums. I've shown the explicit formulas here, but there is a much easier and more elegant way of visualizing this. For those not familiar with Pascal's triangle, it's a deceptively simple yet very useful mathematical object. You always start and end a row with ones, and the value of any position in the interior of a row is just the sum of the two numbers above it. That's it, that's all there is to it, which is why it's deceptively simple. There are a lot of hidden patterns in this triangle and more are being discovered all the time, despite the fact it's been around since the mid 17th century and possibly earlier. One pattern you may recognize is that the rows are binomial coefficients and each row sums to a power of two. However, if you were looking at the main diagonals, you notice something that I find quite interesting. I'm showing the triangle left justified so it's easier to see the pattern I'm talking about. The first column is just ones. The second are the natural numbers or counting numbers. The third column is where things get interesting. The third column is a list of partial sums of the natural numbers in the second column. Now these are the triangular numbers that we talked about earlier. In the next column, you see the tetrahedral numbers, then the four simplex numbers, then the five simplex numbers, and so on. I think it's pretty cool. Lists of k-simplex numbers are hiding in Pascal's triangle. This is due to the fact that each column represents the list of partial sums of the numbers in the column directly before it. And that is precisely how we defined our simplex numbers. Well, that's it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, please leave me a comment.